Yes, ma'am. I go. <laughs> <laughs> you didn't forget. I got it. All right. So <clears throat> I'm going to be uh, teaching out of our engage manual and talking a little bit about what's in here. So you know where to go and study and read. And then um, I'm going to pull up uh, this PowerPoint I normally use for lecture. I just want to show you a couple of pictures out of it. Um, I don't have that PowerPoint posted because we don't need the whole PowerPoint. But the couple little pictures that, I, that I'm going to show you in uh, today's class is in the lecture book. Anyway, if you want to see them. But there's not a whole lot that we're going to do out of there. I just want you to be able to visualize um, the spe specific section I'm going to be talking about. All right. So let's go over the functions of the respiratory system and stating the obvious your respiratory system, as you know, is involved in allowing you to take air in and out of your lungs and the rest of the respiratory system for gas exchange. I mean, that's kind of what we know. We want to load the blood with oxygen and breathe in. We want to remove carbon dioxide from the blood. We breathe that out, right? But the respiratory system is involved in these things as well. When you breathe air through your nose, <clears throat> When the air goes through your nasal cavity and hits the mucous membrane in there, it warms it up, it moistens it, and it filters out uh, any inhaled dirt, debris, dust, sometimes little microbes and stuff like that, that we're always inhaling in. Um, so obviously you can see the importance of that. We filter out all of these particles so they don't go to the deep parts of our lung. But why is it important to warm the air up? Well, warm air, expands a lot easier than cold air. So we're not going over the gas laws in here, but you're, you're gonna learn them in your lecture. But uh, as you breathe in warm air, it helps the lungs expand. If you've ever gone outside and it's really cold and you try to breathe in as hard as you can, like through your mouth, it kind of hurts your lungs a little bit, right? It feels tight. That's because cold air doesn't expand as well. So th that's one of the importance. Yeah, that's, that's why it's important for warming air up. It helps us expand our lungs. In order for us to inhale air, our lungs have to expand. Obviously, you smell through your nose, which is the sense of olfaction. We learned that word in AMP1. Um, speech and a modification of speech all happens as we force air through our vocal cords in our larynx, which is your voice box. The respiratory system is one of two organ systems that regulate blood pH at the organ level. Now we're gonna talk about pH regulation a lot more in the very last lab, but I'm gonna mention pH today and start introducing you to that. But uh, our lungs are able to get rid of acid out of our blood by getting rid of CO2. So if we start to become too acidic, we can respire faster, breathe in and out faster, and it helps us get rid of CO2. And, and when we do that, it gets rid of acid and it brings our pH back to normal. Um, so we're gonna talk a little bit more about that in our last lab. And the last thing that we have here is that the respiratory system is involved in at least assisting in the regulation of blood pressure. It doesn't do it directly, but it assists in it because it's involved in this renin angiotensin aldosterone pathway that had been mentioned earlier in the semester. The RAA, that's the most important hormonal regulator of blood pressure in our body. And the reason why the respiratory system is involved with that is because in the capillaries around the lungs, the pulmonary capillaries, we have an enzyme called angiotensin converting enzyme or ACE, and that enzyme is what finalizes the production of angiotensin II. And angiotensin II has five principal effects in our body, and all of those effects tries to increase your blood pressure, maintain and increase blood pressure. So without angiotensin II being produced by that enzyme in the lung, it wouldn't be active, all right? So that's why that's there. Obviously, your lungs are not regulating blood pressure directly, but it's assisting in it by allowing this pathway to proceed to produce angiotensin II, right? Now, as far as the system is concerned, we can separate the system, classify it structurally and functionally. Structurally, we have upper and lower respiratory systems. 
Like I'm sure you heard someone say they have an upper respiratory infection or a lower respiratory oh, yeah. infection. So the upper respiratory tract is everything above your larynx, which is basically your throat at your, what we call our pharynx and then your nose. So your nose, your nasal cavity, and the three parts of your throat, which are called the, the nasopharynx, the oropharynx, and the laryngopharynx. So all of that is what we call our upper respiratory system or tract. And your lower system is from your voice box, which is the larynx, all the way through all the tubes, your windpipe, which is the trachea, and then the tubes that enter and dive into the lungs called the bronchial system. So all of the bronchi and all their branches that go deep into the lungs from there down to the deep parts of the lungs is your lower respiratory tract. Now, as far as the structures are concerned, we can classify them functionally based on whether or not gas exchange occurs. So in the different parts of the system, are we having the exchange of oxygen and CO2 is the question. And all of the parts where no gas exchange occurs would be referred to as conducting zone structures and they're part of the conducting system. So where in our respiratory system do we not have gas exchange? Well, almost the whole tract. So it goes all the way from your nose, your, into your throat, your pharynx, down your windpipe, the trachea, and all of the bronchi, at least down to what we call a terminal bronchiole which you'll be identifying on a model. So all the way down to microscopic little tubes, there's no gas exchange. But just past those, that last little tube, we have what are called the respiratory structures and they're part of, or respiratory zone structures, they're part of the respiratory portion of the system, which include the respiratory bronchioles and then something called an alveolar duct, the alveolar sacs, and then the individual alveoli, which are the deepest parts of our lung. And this is where the majority of our gas exchange occurs. So we actually begin gas exchange at something called a respiratory bronchiole. This is a very microscopic tube that's in the deepest parts of our lung in what's called a bronchopulmonary segment. So just know which, which parts of the system we have no gas exchange, so we call them conducting, and which parts we do, and we call them respiratory structures. The other thing that I have here that I want you to know in this little paragraph um, is the types of cells that make up the alveolus. So if you never heard of it, an alveolus, which is singular, is a little bitty ball looking structure that's deep in our lung. And that's where the majority of gas exchange occurs. And the wall of that little ball, so to speak, is made up of simple squamous cells. So you learned simple squamous epithelium back in AMP1. I'm, I know everybody remembers that. So those simple squamous cells that make up the wall of this alveolus are called type 1 alveolar cells. So those type 1 alveolar cells allow for a very quick and efficient gas exchange because they're flat. Remember, squamous cells are flat. So oxygen and CO2 actually travel through the cell much quick, much more quickly because there's not much distance for the gases to travel through because the cells are flattened out. That would be much different if it was columnar cells, right? They would have to go all the way through from one end to the cell through the column out the other end. That would take forever. So it's good for us that those cells that line the deep parts of our lung and the alveoli are flat type one alveolar cells. So the gases can diffuse across a respiratory membrane much more efficiently. Now we also have type two cells. The type two alveolar cells are cuboidal type cells. And the importance of those cuboidal cells is that they produce a secretion called surfactant. So I don't know if you ever heard of surfactant. You might have read on it already if you did a little reading. But <clears throat> surfactant is made up of lipids and proteins that in water that actually separate water molecules apart from each other a little bit. And 
decreases the surface tension of the water on the inside of the alveolus. So the inside of the alveolus is not dry. It's actually a little moist. And if it was just pure water that was in, that was lining the inside of the wall of the alveolus, that would be bad because all of the water molecules are very cohesive. They like to be attracted to other water molecules very strongly. And so the problem with that occurs in premature babies, the example that we're gonna do. And you guys know pre the premature babies, sometimes they have to be put on a, the, the little ventilators. Um, they have a, a potential chance of developing respiratory distress syndrome, RDS, if you've never heard of that. And so what this is, is a premature baby, depending on how premature he or she is born, when they take their first breath, their lungs inflate with air. But when they go to exhale, since there's no surfactant or very little surfactant has been secreted at this point, the water molecules are strongly attracted to each other and it makes the walls of the alveoli collapse down on themselves. And the little baby's respiratory muscles aren't strong enough to reinflate the lungs because the walls are stuck together. And so you got to put them on a little ventilator. So in term babies and in, obviously in adults, children and adults, we produce this surfactant. And so what that surfactant does again is it reduces the ability of water molecules to be attracted very strongly to each other. That's called surface tension. So it reduces the surface tension and prevents the little alveoli from collapsing down on themselves. So that's the importance of surfactant. All right, the next little section in here that I want you to read through, um, and we, we just have to really know a couple of things in here, so I'm gonna point them out, is where are the control centers located for, in, in the nervous system for the regulation of breathing patterns, right? How, how do we increase or decrease our respiratory rate? Um, how do we you know, breathe when we're sleeping and stuff like that? Well. The respiratory centers are located in the brain stem. And I don't know if you remember from AMP1, but the brain stem is made up of the midbrain, the pons, and the medulla oblongata. So our respiratory centers are located in the pons and the, and the medulla, in the, what's called the medullary center. So in the medulla, we have two groups of neurons and cell bodies that regulate our respiratory muscles. And so those are called the dorsal respiratory group or DRG and the ventral respiratory group or the VRG. So these two groups of neurons and neuron cell bodies are involved in activating and inactivating your respiratory muscles. Everybody kind of knows one of them, at least the diaphragm, but there are several muscles involved in respiration. We're not going over those muscles right now, but nonetheless, in order for us to inhale air in, we have to contract muscles. That's always an active process. We have to contract a muscle, which we call respiratory muscles, in order for us to draw air in. Technically, to breathe out, all you have to do is relax that muscle, unless you're trying to do a forced expiration, like to try and exhale more air out than normal. But that's neither here nor there. So what are these, what's the DRG and the VRG do anyway? Well, the DRG is the group of neurons in the medulla that causes us to have our normal, quiet, respiratory breathing pattern. So what do I mean to say by normal, quiet breathing? Well, we have something called quiet breathing or tidal breathing. Quiet breathing is what you're doing right now. You're not thinking about inhaling a lot of air you're not thinking about exhaling you kind of are just breathing so that's what we call our quiet breathing which is much different if you started working out then you would start doing this <sighs> you know something like that trying to breathe deeper and faster right so that's a different breathing pattern so when you're at rest and you're not physically active 
you're drawing in a little bit of air. We're going to we're going to learn what volume of air that is at the very end. And that is called our tidal volume. And so we do that during our quiet breathing. So you can think of the DRG as the group of neurons that regulate your normal, quiet respiratory pattern. Right. Now, the VRG is the group of neurons in neuron cell bodies that ultimately interact with the DRG to alter those breathing patterns. So for instance, um, when there are changes in our blood gas that we're gonna talk about, if we become acidic, um, if you start uh, choking or coughing or uh, sneezing or um, when you first start to exercise, we have to change the forcefulness of how much air we take in and how much air we exhale out. So the VRG is involved with altering um, the DRG activity in order to cause what we call a forced inhalation or, and or a forced expiration or exhalation. So for instance, when you go to sneeze, you, you could feel your, your, your abdominal muscles contract. And the reason for that is because those muscles in your, in your core, when they contract, they cause your lungs to expel more air out than normal. So those are, are what we would call our expiratory muscles. Um, the VRG is involved in regulating the DRG when, when we have something like that happen. So the DRG is the main thing that we, that the main group of neurons that, that regulate your your breathing pattern the vrg alters it we also have a little group of neurons in the pons called the pontine group the pontine group um, is a group of neurons that also interact with the drg and the vrg to change your breathing patterns and for instance if you read down here at the bottom when you begin to exercise, the pontine group and the VRG alter what the DRG is doing. So we start to breathe deeper and faster. And all of this is altering your respiratory muscles, by the way, how strongly they contract, how often they contract and the like. Um, what happened, and, and by the way, all of those muscles are skeletal muscles which are voluntarily regulated. You guys remember that from AMP1. So how do we not stop breathing when we go to sleep and we're not conscious? Well, we have groups in the, in the pontine group that alter the DRG to allow us to breathe when we sleep. So when we, if someone passes out or if they uh, go to sleep, they don't stop breathing. Now that's different if somebody hits their head, like if they fall and hit their head and they damage the brain stem, they might, they might damage the, the, that group of neurons and they possibly could stop breathing. I mean, one day, hopefully not, but y'all might see patients that something like that happens, head injury and the patient's not breathing. Um, there are certain drug overdoses that block the neuronal patterns from the brain stem and people stop breathing. That's one of the, things that happens when with overdoses um, with certain types of, of drugs, illicit drugs. Um, so these areas in the brainstem do this in a nutshell again. The DRG is for normal quiet breathing. The VRG is for when we need to have a forced inspiration and a forced expiration. And what I mean by forced is you need to take in a lot of air at one time and expel a lot of air at one time. That's called a forced inspiration and a forced expiration. And then the pontine group is involved in altering our breathing patterns during exercise, sleep, and speech. Now, what regulates those neurons? What makes them become activated in order to activate skeletal muscle activity, respiratory muscle activity, or what makes them inhibit our skeletal muscle activity to alter our breathing pattern. Something, they have to have some sort of a, a sensory input, which allows those neurons 
to become active or inactive to alter the contraction and relaxation state of our respiratory muscles. Well, we have two types of receptors. We talked about these previously. We're gonna talk about them again. We have chemoreceptors, which are receptors that have the job of monitoring the changes in the chemistry of fluids in the body. So we have two basic groups of chemoreceptors that are important here. We have a group of those chemoreceptors that are located in the medulla oblongata, in the brainstem. Those chemoreceptors are referred to as central chemoreceptors. Central chemoreceptors monitor the changes of hydrogen ion concentration. That's this H in brackets. The brackets is a chemical notation for concentration. So they monitor how much hydrogen ion is in solution, which is indicative of pH, and how much carbon dioxide is in solution. And we call that the partial pressure. That's what this little piece for. They monitor the partial pressure of CO2 and the solution I'm talking about is cerebrospinal fluid. They monitor what the pH is and what the CO2 level is in cerebrospinal fluid. That's what the central chemoreceptors do. The peripheral chemoreceptors are located in your aortic arch and in your carotid arteries at what's called the carotid sinus. So these peripheral chemoreceptors, <clears throat> excuse me, also monitor chemical changes, but since they're in the arteries, they monitor the chemical changes in our blood. So those peripheral chemoreceptors monitor the change in all three of these. What is the oxygen level in the blood? Called the partial pressure of oxygen. What is the concentration of hydrogen ion or pH? in the blood. And what is the partial pressure of CO2 in the blood? All of these are important. And I'm going to go over that a little bit right now with you again. So obviously, you know, you need enough oxygen in the blood so your cells can live and make ATP aerobically, right? So that's a given. So we don't want too little of that. That would be bad. But the level of hydrogen that's in the blood, <clears throat> hydrogen ion, is indicative of pH. And so when the concentration of hydrogen goes up, the pH goes down and you become acidic or the blood pH would become acidic. On the other hand, if the hydrogen ion concentration was low, the pH would go up and you would be alkaline. So if we have too much hydrogen in the blood, you develop what's called acidosis. If there's not enough hydrogen in the blood, meaning the pH is high, you develop alkalosis. So those are some pH disorders that we're going to learn about. We're actually going to learn about the four principal acid base imbalances in our very last lab. But this pH is important. It's a very strong signifier of what our respiratory system needs to do in order to keep us healthy. And I'm going to explain it in a second. And then we have CO2. How much CO2 is in the blood means something. All three of these have a physiological limit, a range, if you will, that they have to stay within. There's a range for oxygen. There's a range for pH or hydrogen. There's a range for how much CO2 needs to be in the blood. So if, if the CO2 gets too high, that actually causes the blood pH to go down. It drops. So CO2 is actually related to acid. We're going to go over that chemistry in a second. So if we have too much CO2 in the blood, then your pH drops and you become acidic. If you have too much hydrogen in the blood, your pH drops and you become acidic, right? 
So let me give you what I call the Tom Russell workout analogy and how I'm blood sorry, chemistry. Can, can you can you repeat this again? And uh, this the amount of CO two if it's high, the person become acidic or um, alkalosis. Yeah, Marcia, I'm going to talk about that again in a in a second. But if oh. CO two is too high, the patient becomes acidic. Thank if you. the if the CO two is too low, that's going to become more evident. I'm about to talk about it a little bit more. So let me tell you the importance of monitoring the, these chemical changes in the blood and in the cerebrospinal fluid. But notice the central chemoreceptors are only monitoring hydrogen and CO2. They don't technically monitor O2. So they're monitoring these, but the, the peripheral chemoreceptors monitor all three. So why do you start breathing deeper and faster when you're working out, running, riding a bike, running on a treadmill? Everybody knows when you're working out, you start breathing fast. Why does that happen? Well, partially the reason why that happens is because all of these chemical values in your blood begin to change. So let's, let's do a, a rudimentary analysis of this very quickly. Let's say you're working out. You know your muscles need more oxygen, they're working out because they have to make a lot of ATP, right? Aerobically. So your muscles start initially taking out a lot of O2, oxygen, out of the blood. So initially your O2 levels start to fall. Likewise, any metabolically active tissue produces more acids than bases. So the hydrogen ion concentration starts to go up because let's face it, your muscles are working out. Everybody knows you're making lactic acid, right? Uh, so your hydrogen goes up. Also, the byproduct of making ATP aerobically is the production of CO2. That's where CO2 comes from in our body, from every cell in your body performing aerobic respiration. So when you begin to work out, your oxygen falls, your hydrogen goes up, and your CO2 goes up. So the brain thinks, hey, we don't have enough oxygen. We better start respiring faster to load more oxygen in the blood. The brain thinks, hey, we have too much CO2 in the blood. We better start respiring faster so we can exhale out more CO2. And then as far as H is concerned, the, the, the brain's thinking, well, are we, we're too acidic. We better breathe faster. And, and the reason for that is because when you get rid of more CO2, it brings the pH back down. But when the oxygen is low, the hydrogen is high, the CO2 is high, your medullary centers, the VRG and the DRG, and the pontine group in the ponds make you breathe faster and deeper in order to correct the changes that occurred in these chemicals in the blood. We don't want our O2 staying low. So we want to breathe faster to load more oxygen in the blood. And we want to get rid of acid. Our respiratory system does that by exhaling out CO2. So by respiring faster, not only do you put more oxygen in the blood, but you're getting rid of more CO2, which brings the hydrogen level back down to normal. Your acidic level comes back down to normal. So this is why this chemistry changes is, is what the chemical changes in the blood and in the cerebrospinal fluid, because your cerebrospinal fluid chemistry would change as well when the blood changes. Um, these chemical changes are monitored in order to regulate the DRG, the VRG, and the pontine group, right? So all, by regulating those groups of neurons because of these chemical changes, you either breathe normally, like when you're just not physically active, like right now, unless you're running on a treadmill listening to this, that would be kind of kind of interesting uh, since we're talking about this. But while you're just sitting there and you're not physically active, you're breathing normally. When we go to run on a treadmill, you start breathing faster and deeper sooner or later, right? And that's because of these chemical changes. But it's also due to these receptors, the proprioceptors. The proprioceptors are receptors that are found in and around the joints of the body. So those are the receptors that tell your brain when you're physically active. So your brain, 
your brain always knows when your arms and legs are moving because of what's called proprioception. So these proprioceptors fire off to the brain and tells your brain, hey, their legs are moving, their arms are moving, they're physically active. Let's increase our respiratory rate. So when the proprioceptors are telling the brain that you're moving, initially your respiratory rate increases. This is actually the first reflex that occurs. So I don't know if you ever noticed, but when you first start exercising, you might start breathe, your respiratory rate might increase a little bit. And then all of a sudden, as, you're, as you continue to exercise, maybe on a Stairmaster or on a treadmill or something, your breathing rate falls a little bit. I don't know if you ever noticed that, probably not. That's because the proprioceptors tell your brain that you're, you're active. And so your brain says, yep, they're active. We better start breathing faster in preparation for oxygen demand. But the proprioceptive reflex, as it's called, is a guess for the brain to know how fast you're supposed to breathe. Because at this point, you just started working out. Your, your blood chemistry hasn't really changed yet. So the first reflex that happens is just a guess. Yep, let's start uh, increasing the rate just in case. But let's say you're just walking. Yep, we're active. So you start breathing faster and all of a sudden you keep walking and then you start breathing normal again. You know, that's because after a small amount of time, which only takes a couple of minutes, your chemoreceptive reflex kicks in with the changes in cerebrospinal fluid in the blood. The, the, the changes from the chemoreceptor activity is the truest information that goes to our respiratory centers in the brain to let your brain know how fast you really have to be breathing. What are the true oxygen demands, in other words? Comes from the chemoreceptive reflex, not the proprioceptive reflex. Now, another easy way to describe this reflex, the same thing happens with your heart rate and your blood pressure. The same receptors are involved with that, except they just fire to the cardiovascular center as well. So, when you first start working out, if you ever take your blood pressure, I mean, your, your uh, I'm sorry, your, your heart, your pulse, your heart rate, when you first start working out, your, your heart rate goes up. But all of a sudden, as, as you just begin the workout, say on, walking on a treadmill or something, your heart rate actually goes down a little bit. I don't know if you ever noticed that. And the reason for that is when you first start to move, the proprioceptors tell your cardiovascular center that you're moving. And so they send out sympathetic information to your pacemaker on your heart and it increases your heart rate initially until the chemoreceptive reflex kicks in, which tells the cardiovascular center what the true demand is for blood flow to your muscles. And so then that would be a, the, the time when your heart rate meets its maximum for whatever workout you're doing. So that's how these little reflexes work, by the way. They help regulate heart rate and blood pressure as well as respiratory rate. Kind of cool. All right, so uh, before I get back into that chemistry, which I'm gonna do in a second, I need to explain to you how the, the respiratory gases are transported in the body. I want you to know, that, know how they're transported. Um, so pretty much everybody knows that oxygen is transported in a red blood cell, the erythrocyte. About 98.5% of all of the oxygen that is loaded in the blood actually enters the red blood cell, the erythrocyte, and it binds to hemoglobin. Specifically, it binds to the iron, the iron ion on the heme group in the hemoglobin. So the hemoglobin molecule Inside the red blood, blood cell is what transports the oxygen in the blood cell for us. And when oxygen is bound to hemoglobin, it's called oxyhemoglobin. So when hemoglobin is saturated with oxygen, each one can carry four oxygen molecules, by the way. So when they're attached to hemoglobin, hemoglobin is called oxyhemoglobin. So what happens to the other one and a half percent of oxygen, though? Well, as the oxygen is going from the, uh, from the lungs into the blood, 
about one and a half percent of the oxygen stays dissolved in the plasma. The majority of it goes into the red blood cell, all right? But about one and a half percent stays dissolved in plasma. So this is gonna be on that picture I'm gonna show you in a minute. Now, what about carbon dioxide? How is carbon dioxide transported in the blood? Well, all of our carbon dioxide, by the way, comes from all of the cells in your body, except for mature red blood cells, from all of the other cells in your body that are performing aerobic respiration, the waste respiratory gas, CO2, is produced as a byproduct. So all the cells in your body, just by living and making ATP aerobically, are producing CO2. And that CO2 then is uh, dumped into the blood from all the cells. So once that CO2 is diffusing out of all of the cells in the body into the blood, 7% of that CO2 stays dissolved in the plasma. 7%. The other 93% actually enters the red blood cell, the erythrocyte. Now, 23% of that 93%, when it enters the red blood cell, it combines with hemoglobin. And when CO2 combines with hemoglobin, it, it forms what we call carbaminohemoglobin. That's how you say that, carbaminohemoglobin. So hemoglobin is transporting oxygen for us, so we know that, but it also transports a little bit of the CO2 for us in our blood. It also transports another gas called nitric oxide, one of the most important vasodilators in the body, but it's a little beyond the scope of this lecture, but nonetheless, hemoglobin can transport these respiratory gases for us, albeit carbon dioxide doesn't bind to the iron on the heme group like oxygen does, it actually binds to the protein portion of hemoglobin. It's called the globin portion. So that 23% of that CO2 that enters the red blood cell combines with hemoglobin. The majority of all of the CO2 that is in the blood that obviously enters the red blood cell, 70% of all of that 93% that entered the red blood cell is actually converted into a weak acid called carbonic acid during this chemical equation. So we're gonna see this chemical equation again uh, towards the end of the semester. This chemical equation occurs in many cells around the body. It occurs in red blood cells, many other cells in your, in your kidney. So ultimately this is what happens. Carbon dioxide combines with water in the presence of the enzyme called carbonic anhydrase, CA. So carbonic anhydrase actually combines carbon dioxide and water together to form this acid, H2CO3. H2CO3 is called carbonic acid. So this carbonic acid can split up into two conjugate ions, a cation, which is in this case hydrogen, and an anion, bicarbonate. HCO3 minus is bicarbonate. So bicarbonate is a very important buffer in our body for pH. We're gonna talk about that a lot more um, in upcoming uh, exercises. I'll give you a little introduction into it today as well. But look at this HCO3 minus. We're carrying CO2 in the form of bicarbonate. So you can see HCO3 minus has a CO2 buried in there. So technically, the majority, 70%, of all the CO2 that is being transported in the blood is converted into bicarbonate. Now, hydrogen is also liberated. So hydrogen is going to be liberated into the blood, technically in a red blood cell. So I'm gonna show you this chemistry from a picture. 
so we can learn it a little bit better and learn about what the chloride shift is and uh, what these bicarbonate ions are doing. So I need to stop sharing this for a second. And I need to share this. All right, so this is a PowerPoint that I, I usually use for lecture. Um, I'm not posting this PowerPoint in lab because it, it has a lot more stuff in it than what we need to know for lab. But if you're interested in it, um, you can look in your lecture book. If you don't have your lecture book, just email me and I'll try and send it to you. But there's not really a whole lot we need to know from here. I just like using these pictures to explain it because most of us are visual learners anyway. So we have, to, we have to learn a couple of things. Number one, gas exchange and then the transport of these gases and then go into the chemistry a little bit more. So look at this picture for a minute and what we have here, representation of anyway. So this represents the cardiovascular system, right? This represents the pulmonary circuit at the top. This represents the systemic circuit at the bottom, some things we learned about already. Up here at the top, this represents the lungs. Specifically, all of these little balls are alveoli. And collectively together, this would be called an alveolar sac right here. And this little tube would be called the alveolar duct. Some things that I mentioned earlier. So here's, the, here's what you know already. When you breathe in, we load the blood with oxygen. When we breathe out, we get rid of CO2 from the blood and we exhale it out, right? We kind of know that. So when we load the blood with oxygen from the lungs and we get rid of CO2 from the blood back to the lungs, we're basically exchanging these respiratory gases from the lungs and the blood. When you exchange respiratory gases between the lungs and the blood, that's called external respiration external respiration. Now, way down here, as the, as the oxygenated blood goes to the left side of the heart, and then the aorta, and then out back out to the body, that's the systemic circuit, that freshly oxygenated blood goes through the capillary beds by all the tissue beds in the body that are vascular anyway. And so the oxygen is going to go from the blood to the cells that need it. The CO2 is going to go from the cells that are performing aerobic respiration back into the blood. So the exchange of oxygen to and from the blood and the body cells and CO2 to and from the body cells to the blood is referred to as internal respiration. So we actually have what's called external and internal respiration. So let me show you this picture. It's the same picture, but with our numbers on it. So look what happens at external respiration. Yep. We're loading the blood with oxygen about one and a half percent stays dissolved in plasma. The other 98 and a half percent enters the erythrocyte and binds to hemoglobin. And when oxygen is bound to hemoglobin, that's called oxyhemoglobin. Now, if you look down here at the bottom, obviously the oxygen is going to leave the red blood cell and leave the uh, leave uh, the plasma. And I know they only show the one and a half percent, but um, the oxygen is leaving the blood and going to our body cells. The body cells are dumping in their CO2 waste product from aerobic respiration. 7% stays dissolved in the plasma and just flows in the plasma. The other 93% goes into the red blood cell. So this is one thing I don't like about the picture. They show the other 70% going straight into the plasma. Bicarbonate doesn't go straight from the cell into the plasma like this. All of the 93% goes directly into the red blood cell. 23% stays bound to hemoglobin, in which case you see right there, HB is hemoglobin with a bonded to the CO2. That's called carbamine hemoglobin. The other 70%, <coughs> excuse me, actually enters into a chemical reaction that we just looked at in this red blood cell 
and forms bicarbonate that then leaves and gets into the blood. So that's what I want us to look at. What happens with this 93% of the CO2 that enters this red blood cell? And I'm gonna show you that from this picture. Now, what we're looking at here is still what we call external respiration. That's the top picture up here at the top. And then internal respiration down here at the bottom. The reason for that is this little area, you see the little endothelial cells here that form the pulmonary capillary wall. So this is all the blood, obviously the red blood cell here, the plasma flowing right there. And this is the represents the alveolus of the lung. So when we have gas exchange, O2 going to the blood, CO2 leaving the blood to go to the lung, that's always called external respiration, right? So let's start at the bottom down here. This is internal respiration, which is the exchange of gases to and from the blood and the body cells. Here's our body tissue cell over here. So look what happens with CO2. All of the body cells are producing the CO2 as a waste product. Again, I keep saying aerobic respiration um, to make ATP. And that CO2 is going to leave, get into the blood. Now, they don't show it, but 7% of that CO2 as it's diffusing into the blood is going to stay dissolved in plasma and just flow in the plasma, 7%. The other 93% of that CO2 enters the red blood cell across the plasma membrane. CO2 and oxygen, for that matter, by the way, are lipid soluble. So they, they, are, they readily diffuse across the plasma membrane, the phospholipid bilayer. So CO2, 93% of it enters the red blood cell. 23% of that CO2 combines with hemoglobin to form what we call carbaminohemoglobin, right here. Carbaminohemoglobin. The other 70% of that CO2 combines with water in the presence of carbonic anhydrase to form carbonic acid, H2CO3. H2CO3 Carbonic acid splits up into its conjugate ions. The anion is bicarbonate, HCO3 minus, and the cation, which is hydrogen. Now remember, hydrogen ion basically is representative of acid. And by the way, an acid is defined as any substance that can release hydrogen into solution. So that's what carbonic acid is doing here. It's releasing hydrogen in solution. Now, that hydrogen in the red blood cell can be buffered by hemoglobin. We're going to talk about protein buffering systems later, but hemoglobin is a protein, and it can soak up at least some of the hydrogen. So the hemoglobin